Insulin resistance. Hot topic right now. I think a lot of people are realizing they either have it. They know someone who has it. Is it mainly in women? I don't know a lot about it. So I would love for you to do like a deep dive into it. So um, insulin resistance is in many ways kind of a precursor to a lot of bad things that happen disease wise. So you, Michael, you talked about the four horsemen a minute ago. So we talked about heart disease, um, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, which includes the most common of these is Alzheimer's disease, but also other types of dementia. All of these, and those three things, by the way, account for like two thirds of deaths. Those things are all made worse if you are insulin resistant and insulin resistance is the precursor to diabetes. So let's start by what is insulin resistance? How is it diagnosed? How do you fix it? All those things. So to understand what insulin resistance is, you kind of have to understand what insulin is. I can't, I have tried in vain to explain insulin resistance without explaining insulin. It doesn't go very far. So insulin is a hormone made by, uh, a little gland behind your stomach called the pancreas. It's a very important hormone. So important that if you can't make it, you will die unless it is replaced. So there's a disease called type one or juvenile diabetes where the pancreas can't make insulin anymore. And until about a hundred years ago, those kids all died. So what does this hormone do? So this hormone is secreted from the pancreas into the bloodstream in response to glucose. What is glucose? Glucose is a very, very simple sugar. It's what most of the carbohydrates we eat are broken down into. That includes complex carbohydrates like starches and simple carbohydrates like sugars. But they ultimately get broken down into this very simple ring called glucose. Glucose is a very important molecule. Um, it provides a lot of our energy and our brain in particular is so dependent on it. So everything about the way we regulate it is very important. And if you, if the glucose, if the glucose level in your blood gets too high, which it does the moment you start eating carbohydrates, it can become toxic. So we have to be able to take it out of the bloodstream and put it into mostly the muscles, but also the liver. We'll just talk about the muscles because that's where you put most of it. So let's pretend you drink, I don't know, a, a sugary drink with a lot of glucose in it. It'll probably have fructose in it too, but let's just talk about the glucose. What's the fate of that glucose? So you have the capacity to put hundreds of grams of glucose, 200 grams, even in a man, 300 grams of glucose into all of your muscles. But to get it there, you need a channel. You need something that the glucose can get from the blood into the muscle. Like think of a tube, like a straw, a short straw that goes between the muscle surface, the cell of the muscle and the bloodstream. For that straw to know that it needs to go from inside the cell to outside the cell needs to be told chemically to do that. And the thing that tells it is insulin. So insulin is floating around in the blood in response to high amounts of glucose. Insulin binds to a receptor. So a receptor is just like a, think of a glove sitting on a surface and insulin is the ball. The ball lands in the glove and that triggers inside the cell a chemical signal that tells the straw to come up to the surface, which then lets glucose pour into the cell. And the fancy word for that is glucose disposal. So glucose disposal is a very important reason we want muscle. So you remember going back to the very beginning of the discussion, we talked about why is muscle so important? That's a big part of it. Because of the glucose disposal. Glucose disposal. People and if you with, have less, you can't do it as well. That's right. Okay. So high glucose disposal. And then of course, there's all the structural reasons you want to have muscle. Okay. So insulin resistance means the baseball glove when the baseball lands in it, when the insulin hits the insulin receptor, the message isn't getting through to bring the straw up. So all of a sudden, what would happen? Well, now you have all this glucose. You make all this insulin. Insulin tells the muscle, bring me the glucose receptor. Or, sorry, the, the, the glucose receptor, the glucose transporter, and it's not happening. 
So it has to make more insulin. So the first step of insulin resistance is elevated insulin, which is called hyperinsulinemia. That's just the fancy way to say too much insulin, hyperinsulinemia. So the first way that you diagnose insulin resistance in somebody is you give them a glucose drink and you measure their insulin level 30 minutes later. I had to do that pregnant. Yeah, and I bet that they only measured you two hours later. I, the normal test I for a pregnant woman is measure your glucose, give you a glucose drink, then measure it two hours later. I've never Maybe seen someone one. kick and scream more about drinking a drink. She, it's like, so gross. Who yeah. wants to drink that? No, I don't. Really gross. Um, and that's a good poor man's test when you're pregnant. But when you're, and because pregnancy does induce glucose uh, insulin resistance. So that we just have to make sure it's not so far that you get what's called gestational diabetes, which some women get. And if they do, they might need medication to help with that. And in some cases, they might even need insulin during pregnancy. Um, but when we look at this in our patients, we look at not just the glucose level, which can tell you if this might be happening, but a, a more sensitive test is looking at the actual insulin level. But you have to look earlier. You have to look like 30, 60, and 90 minutes after you have that drink. And when that insulin level starts to go up, even if glucose are nor even if glucose levels are normal, you know you have insulin resistance. Why this is happening is very interesting. Um, there's a guy I interviewed on my podcast named Jerry Shulman at Yale who's done the most research on this, and he's demonstrated that it's actually the intramuscular accumulation of fat droplets that is the thing that's impairing that chemical transduction of the signal in the muscle cell and that's actually why the muscle is getting insulin resistant so can you build more muscle to push it out yeah so what's the treatment for this well it's really interesting when gerald shulman was doing research on this a lot of the research they do they're doing on college students and he said the most important thing that they needed when they were recruiting subjects for their studies was they had to be sedentary. Again, it's very hard for someone who's 19 to be insulin resistant. So the key is they can't be active. So rule number one, if you don't want to be insulin resistant, is be active. And basically, I think the three biggest drivers of insulin resistance are inactivity, excess nutrition, going back to the bathtub analogy, right? So too much energy intake, eventually that fat spills out of the subcutaneous, good areas, and then into the bad Access areas. Nutrition like, mean just too much food. Too much food. Yep. And then too, too little sleep. Uh. So there's, a, a, there's an even more technical way to measure insulin resistance that you don't do in normal people in a clinical setting, but you do it in the lab. I've had this done on me. It's called a euglycemic clamp. It's a very, very fancy test where they put two IVs in you, and then they run glucose and insulin in simultaneously and they try to figure out how much insulin you need to keep the glucose at a fixed level oh this is a my crazy God, test sounds like I my worst <laughs> nightmare in hell i can never be a part of your practice if i have to oh do no no that. we don't do that, do in do that? absolutely okay, not. that no, literally no. sounds like my version She's like, of i'm hell. eliminating myself <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> no no that's what they do in the but but that's what they'll do in in, in clinical studies <sighs> But this is the gold standard. So using this clinical gold standard, a researcher at the University of Chicago showed that if you took healthy volunteers who were insulin sensitive and for, I believe it was 10 days, you only let them sleep four hours a night. Oh. Which by the way, I did that for five years, like in residency. Um, if you do that for 10 days, you will reduce their glucose disposal by 50%. So less than two weeks of horrible sleep gets you well down the path to being a diabetic. Wow, so it's not even just a, a fitness and a nutrition thing. If you're, not, if you're sleeping bad, If your sleep is jacked, it's very hard to fix What do you think about problem. people that brag about how they only get five hours of sleep? I mean, I, I don't know what there is to brag about. I understand that there are many people for whom life's circumstances, you know, are challenging and maybe, you know, getting as much sleep as is ideal is, is difficult, but, um, there's nothing about insufficient sleep that's good for your health or good for your performance. Sure. 
There's so. a fourth one, by the way, that's the hardest one to really quantify, but it's high stress. So high stress leads to high cortisol and very high levels of cortisol persistently lead to insulin resistance. 